you are worthy. You are enough for me. Hallelujah. We just sing that song, Christ is enough. Christ is my reward. All of my
says, if we don't praise him, the rocks will cry out instead. Amen. And that terminology, the rocks will cry out, the silent rocks will cry out, even their silence is loud to praise who he is. Amen. And that's why we do that. And so we're going to come in prayer, amen, as we ought to do and as we usually do, bring ourselves before God, our families and friends, before God in this place, respect whatever it is you have a need for, whether it's somebody that's not well, somebody uh, need a breakthrough, whether it's you, a mental breakthrough, that you just need somehow God intervention uh, in your mind and in your life. Uh, Right now in this place is a great time to do that. So we're going to pray. We're going to lift our voices up. And let's believe God that he'll help and intervene. Amen. On this side of life. Father, we thank you, God, for your grace. Father, for your mercy, God, that you have come. Father, in this place, and your blessed hope, God, that you pour out your spirit upon every man and every woman in this place. Touching them, God, by the Spirit of God, I pray, God, to help us, God, in our mental states, God, in our physical state, that financial, God, Father, you walk before us, uh, Father, that the Holy Spirit on the right and our left hand side uh, will be our back, God, I pray, God, watching over us, God, by day and by night, my God, uh, God, I pray, God, for our people, God, your people, God, uh, Father, that some way, God, the Spirit will touch them in a new way of this evening, God, uh, Father, we can leave this place with that you are good, you are a good and mighty God, Father, we're thanking you, God, for all that you're going to do in this place, Father, this blessed hope, God, we have this in you, God, Father, I give you all the praise and all the glory in the wonderful name of your Son, Jesus the Christ, and the Church of God, said, Amen. Amen. Why don't you turn around, greet somebody, make somebody feel especially welcome this evening, Amen, praise God. Good to have you out this evening, this Sunday, Amen. Um, you know, I understand most of you could have just you could have left here and gone back to the blur concert that I'm staying here. Uh, okay. <laughs> what you choose uh, to uh, yeah, yeah, so that's good and happy. And then just a few announcements just for you to remember the trip on the 28th of August. Uh, we are going to have a sign on this for that. People are asking already for that. It's called um, Buttony Bay. <laughs> Buttony Bay. Um, so Buttony Bay is where the trip is. And so I, I, somebody thought it was Italy. I actually thought it was because when I saw the rocks, I was like, man, I, I, I didn't know we had places like that in England. But Buttony Bay is where we have it. So um, that's where we're going to go on the 28th of August. So that's a bank holiday Monday, 22 pounds. And I'm telling you, that's a, that, that's a steal. Amen, to go down to, to Butley Bay, amen, and uh, uh, spend all day down at the beach. Uh, hopefully it's great weather, uh, it's August, so it should be. And so 22 pounds, double, we, instead, we, instead of having two coaches, like we normally do two coaches, we decided to just go for one big double decker. And the reason why is because everybody could be on it and apparently you can, there's these remote controls, you can play games and talk to each other on it. So I, I guess it's, uh, you're kind of like, you're kind of not trying to phone somebody who's in the next coach behind you. You can speak to somebody in the coach downstairs or upstairs. And uh, uh, I think there is um, there's slight refreshments on the coach um, in this terms of drinks and a few snacks, but not everything. So please bring your own chicken and your own uh, fish and your own all you can eat there. But um, I reckon you should just bring your own chicken and your fish so I can walk around the coach and chase it. <laughs> If you know anything about me, I bring no food. I always just nick everybody else's. And so um, that would be great <laughs> for me and you, and you as too. Um, so um, Buttony Bay, it is 22 pounds. So we've already um, secured the coach. So we're not guessing. We've already paid um, half of the, uh, for the coach. And so if you want to go, um, please uh, see Bev or I don't know all the, the, those involved. But we will put a sign-up sheet at the back for that. And I know we are trying to sort Portugal out. We've been asked about Portugal. Are we going to Portugal? And the answer is yes, I believe so. Um, and I, that's sometime in the year. So, uh, But good, two good things. We've, we've, we've managed to, I know it's 
further on, um, um, Pastor Lamont will be coming doing a revival for us. Uh, remember the guy who played the piano and sang? Uh, I don't know. Jeez. Anyway, he's coming, and uh, and um, and um, and we just we we are trying to book our way forward with these revivals. That's good. So do remember Friday next uh, Friday coming. Friday coming is a meeting uh, at seven thirty. All those want to be involved in follow up. Uh, you know, you want to work with people. You want to. All right, maybe not. Okay. So, but if you want to be involved, it's, it's, it's work. Um, and um, the other uh, Saturday coming is our outreach from 12 to, to a time. From there, 12, 9 to 12 o'clock. We meet here Saturday morning, always doors open at 11 o'clock. Come and pray. And then our um, regular prayer meeting will resume after that. Due to the revival, that's why we didn't have one. But I just want to encourage you again and again encouraging the church and uh, I'm telling you come early to church to pray uh, you know there's an old saying get a hold of God before the devil gets hold of you <laughs> just come and pray I mean uh, there's so I know we're so busy with so much in life but I always, I said it to my pastor I said Pastor Brown I said I realize when people pray 20 minutes in the morning that's the sum total of their prayer life because most people, when they pray in the morning, they pray again for the rest of the day. And so, if, 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 that, if, if some talk of your prayer life is 20 minutes, and you go, oh, Pastor, the devil's bothering me. It's like, why would you? It's like, you've only given 20 minutes. You know, it's like, of course it's going to bother you. Pray. Learn to pray. Not just in the morning. Pray. When you're at work, you know, people work in your factory. Have a prayer break. <laughs> go to the toilet, pray, believe God. Amen. You make your life be full of prayer on the bus, on the train. You know, people think you're mad mumbling. Just go shut that out of course I <laughs> So pray. Amen. So amen. Amen. And praise God. Let's give God praise as we take the offering. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you, God. Amen. I want to take tonight's offering. I really appreciate those who are faithful to their tithes and offering. Amen. It makes what we do, what we do, and who we are, who we are, and the ability to do all that we need to do as a, as a people of God. Amen. Incrementally taking the life of Jesus. Amen. So we're going to pray. Bless the gift to give. Brother Keith, why don't you bless the gift to give? Amen. Musicians, amen this evening. Praise God. Man, the drum, the drum sounds sweet. Yeah. Well, that's if you're a drummer, you'll understand. But there you go. Amen. If you have your Bible, amen, uh, John chapter 21. I am going to preach very short. <laughs> uh, no, the reason why, because blur is on. <laughs> <laughs> because the concert in Wembley, and I don't want you to get stuck in the blur traffic and, uh, and all the things that's happening. So, so I, I understand. So we're not going to have tea and coffee only tonight is because, you know, I've got, I want to be sensitive that people get home. If you hang around, you get stuck in that thing. It's kind of blurry. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. John chapter 21. I was kind of inspired by this message um, um, by... Um, one of our pastors, and it's Jesus 
I call it the other side. John 21, and he said to them, cast your net on the right hand side of the boat and you shall find. And so they cast before him and now they were not able to draw for the multitude of fish. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was him. And, Je and Jesus said to them, children, have you no fish? Uh, have, have, you, uh, have you no fish? Have you? And they answered to him, saying, no. And he said to them, cast again right to the right hand side and the boat, and you will find some. Father, I pray by your grace, by your hand, by your spirit, God, you will speak to us and encourage us. Father, I pray in your word, your blessed word, in Jesus' name, amen. And so hear this portion of scripture, and it's an it's, it's, um, it's a, it's, it's a incredible scripture because you'll, you'll read this account in the book of John and the book of Luke, uh, the book of Mark and some portions of the book of Matthew and it's a, you know we're reading this, the, the, these accounts and the account um, is that men who go out to do ordinary things every day and it's their ordinary job it's mundane it's the same thing there's nothing exciting about fishing you know fishermen uh, if you ever meet fishermen and you ever live at a coast where you know I was living at the nearby the coast um, when we were doing the missionary work, um, and I remember just every every you know all the time going to buy fish, seeing the same guys selling me the fish, and it just it just seemed like you know we, we they knew when to go fish, when not to go fish, what time to go and get the fish. Um, I remember the guys who were they were selling. I don't know if you anybody know what a conch is, um, not a conquer a conch. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a, sh a shell, it's in a shell, a nice sort of pinky shell, and um, it's found near the warm seas in the Caribbean, um, and uh, I must say, when the, when the waves crash against the conch and it splits that shell, and it, and it fine, goes fine like sand against the, the stone, that's what gives the sand that pinky type glistenery sort of like look when you look and think, man, it's beautiful. And it's found in Jamaica, so there you go. <laughs> kind of second beach best in the world, but there you go. So anyway, so I was there, so I was there trodden the sand, so I just thought I'd let you know. Look, I'm not against any other country with their sand. I'm just, just, just thought I'd tell you that. So I'm out there, and the guy takes the conch, and he goes way out. And then he, I said, why do you do that? He says, they need some deep, deep water. And then he says, every day I go find back the place. They don't have these, you know, like here we'll have the boy sort of bouncing in the water, they'll just say it was so-and-so and it was over there and I put some whatever, whatever. And they go out and they bring it back in every day. Uh, and so it's always, it's always sea, salty um, conch. And so he does this. But I noticed, I said, you know, so how do you preserve it? And he says, oh, we do, every day. We just do this every day. It's just, just normal. So you get to understand fishermen. It's a normal job. It's an everyday job. They don't go miles and miles and miles unless they're trawlers, deep uh, fish where they're going for cod and things like that. But normal, these are, these, when Jesus is speaking about those, these guys, they're fishing in the Sea of Galilee. And so they're going out, it's the same thing every day. And so they're used to the same job. And they're not very far, so they're not, these are not men that are, are fishing very far. These are men that are fishing very close. Then maybe not early in the morning. Certain times in the morning you can fish um, um, so it, far, but in the afternoon most fishers come close to the shore. And so maybe it's, this is what we're finding, that Jesus is able to shout to them and say, Hey, you got any fish? And they say, oh, We haven't caught none. So they weren't very far from Jesus. And so he says to them, throw it on the other side. Now in their minds, again, you've got to remember this is a normal, everyday job. You know what to do. You're, you're going and you're doing the same thing all the time. And, uh, and so you get used to a certain amount of things. And you, can't, you kind of understand how a school of fish works. You kind of understand, you know, in the evening they'll come, they'll the fish will come closer. That's how it works. And so, you know, when there's no fish, you kind of wonder about the weather. Is there a storm? Is there this? So you start to think about all the different reasons why there's no fish. 
Such is some time in life. When you're in life and you, every day is mundane, every day it's the same thing, you kind of, you know, we don't really come out of our comfort zone in life. We kind of know what's what and what we're going to do from one day to another. Most of you already sort of like brought your ham and your, your pickles and your cheese for tomorrow's lunch. Maybe you don't. But, you know, most people kind of know what they're going to have for lunch tomorrow or what they want to eat for lunch or what they're going to do. Some of you, your work, you remember Friday, you, you know, didn't complete all your work. And you're thinking, well, Monday I'll come in, I'll think, oh, yeah, that thing I've got to complete. And so we go through, you know, all the things we're going to do for Monday morning. And so that's how we are, very, you know, our routine. Mother's think, okay, when I get home, I've got to wash her clothes and put his pants in the dryer because tomorrow he's got play school and da 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 And so most of our days are planned like that. So, because our days are planned like that, most of us don't interrupt our work how we focus. Because, you know, we, we, you know it's like a man turns around and married and says, okay, we go home, bring kids home, put them to bed. And the man says, hey, you know what? I've got to go down to my mother's. And the wife says, we ain't going down there. No, she doesn't, <laughs> she doesn't say that. But, you know, it's like, I've got to go down there and I've got to, how long are you going to be there for? Five minutes. You, you know your five minutes. It's going to be hours and it's going to interrupt my rhythm. And so now my rhythm is going to be interrupted. And so you start to think that type of way about life that not much of us like much interruption. You know, most people hate changes. People, you know, you know, people, you know, people don't like change. People just like, man, I, I, I want to know it's the same thing every, I want routine. And the older you get, the more you want routine. He's like, man, I just want order in my life. And it's like, no chaos. I don't want to be too much. I want to be challenged, but just a little bit. You know, you know that people always turn around and they say, hey, listen, go down to the gym. And someone says, okay. And you know, it only lasts for two weeks. He's running on the treadmill. And thinking, but I'm just running, especially when you're running on the treadmill. You're going nowhere. <laughs> And they, and they put a video on or something, these new tech uh, treadmills, you can watch a whole film and you're like running and, like, and it's like, and then the other ones are pictures of mountains. I mean, that's sandy mountains. And you, just run, and you realize you haven't gone nowhere apart from the treadmill and someone keeps coming off and no new person comes on. And so after a while, it's kind of like, I'm staying in my house. The other day I wanted to go swim. And I said, do I really want to do it? And I was like, no, of course I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I was honest to myself. I said, you know what? I am not going. I don't, I don't want to go. And you know, because I'm, I'm sitting there, the sun is out, it's a beautiful day, and I think, why do I want to go swim and all the way up the road, walk all the way up the road? And then I went upstairs, and then I was washing my hands, and I stood on the scale, and I went, <laughs> you better go swimming. <laughs> So I went swimming. So, you know, <laughs> there you go. But, but you, know, <laughs> you know, we don't like to break the routine. And so it is here. The disciples are there and they're, 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 they're going to fish. There's no fish. And so Jesus is on the shore and he says, throw the net on the other side. But you see, the problem is they've already made plans. And so when you're casting a net, it's, 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 it's a huge thing when they, when they say cast the net. It's not like this little net, like, like a little net curtain. It's a massive net with all these weights and they have to throw this net and it sinks and you have to wait a little while. You know, when a fisherman comes back and he drags the net, they don't often drag back nets. They often just leave the net, wait for a while, throw feed in the water, and that's the game of fishing. It's just a waiting game. It's not something that you pull. But obviously, they did it. They pulled. There's a certain part how the boat is set up and to throw the net. And they obviously pulled back the net to find when they looked in the net, there was nothing in it. They spend a lot of time with this. It's, it's a... You know, a revelation that, you know, the, the, the knots in the net, you know, they, they mend those things. They, that's the problem. Every time you pull back, the nets that they had, they were called drag nets. They weren't like nets, like you throw it, it it's called a drag net. So basically, the, the boat moves and the net pulls against the bottom. 
It's called a dragnet. And the problem with dragnets is that they, because they go at the bottom, uh, they meet all these different types of rocks and stones, and they, as they're dragging, they, they burst. And they've got to come back and repair the nets. Now, if you remember, previous, they, the nets was in the water, and the nets had burst, and they have to repair the nets. That's a good revelation for some to know that every knot in the net represents me and you. And Jesus comes and re relationships and friendships in church, he tries to mend those things. It's very important that you and I have good relationships with each other in church. Because, you know, when, 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 when the knots are broken, because you know what happens? People come to church and they have the ability to drag you in disputes, drag you in arguments, drag you into their mess. Do you know what she said about me? She said, and I like the way the woman did it with their heads. Like, you know, she, said, she said that. She said, and I don't, you know what I mean? Like, and they walk around church. Like, oh. <laughs> no, they don't judge. <laughs> but you know, you know, and they drag into it. But now the net's torn. And then when people get saved, they get saved in the net. And you think you're pulling somebody, pull it, let's, let's, let's bring them in, let's bring them in, and they, they, they're gone. Why? Because you didn't repair relationships. Forget about the internet. This is the real net. So you get this picture that they drag the net back in, but often they don't want to because of the problems it's going to cause bringing the net back in. But Jesus is on the shore, and he's not a fisherman. He's a carpenter. And that's the problem. <laughs> because Jesus is a carpenter, and it's almost like, you're, you're doing something, you're working on something. And, and, you know, somebody said to me today, they said, hey, Pastor, why can't you put the, the TV, make the TV do this and do that? And I said, yeah, well, you know, it's not, it's not that easy. And they said, well, why don't you get one of those ports that come in and there's a PSP port and it goes, and I'm like, you know about this stuff? No? So why are you telling me? If you don't know about it, what are you <laughs> it's like, you're telling me something you don't, I know IT. <laughs> I, you know, but I don't actually. But the, 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 the point is, you don't have a plumber telling an electrician what to do. Yeah? You know, um, Brent Council, they would employ plumbers, you know, no, you know uh, plumbers as fire alarm, fire alarm engineers or marshals. And if, why do you call a plumber for? Well, if there's a fire, he's a plumber, he knows about water. No, that, you, don't, you don't employ, right? You get the person that knows about what he does. Right? <laughs> right? So Jesus is a carpenter. He's on land. He makes tables and chairs. Mm -hmm. These men are in the sea. And they know how to fish. And so Jesus comes on and goes, listen. Drag back your net. I throw it on the other side. Now that might sound simple to you. But the, the trouble is the boat is set up a different way. They set their boats up so they can drag. Giving themselves enough room so they can pull. So to drag the net, throw the net the other side, you have to maneuver everything. And people don't like change. And that was a problem. And sometimes you look at that and you say to yourself, do I have to? And the truth sometimes is this. You've got to be very sensitive to when God speaks to you. And in that way of God speaking to you, you've got to be sensitive but not just hear God, learn to obey God. Because he might be telling you something what you don't know. And so it is. I think it was very hard to obey him. I think there was a struggle here. But somehow something kicked into them and said, you know what? This is the Lord. Let's obey him. And so, you know, maybe some of the boat was like, He's, he's out in the sea and he's way down there. He's like, throw the nets on the other side. You serious going to listen to him? <laughs> he can't hear us. You serious going to listen to him? Don't throw the nets on the other side. Come on. Come on. It might not be God. <laughs> you know how we are? God speaks to you and then you inquire of somebody who's not God. <laughs> you go and ask your mate, hey, what do you think about God? Well, God told me this. No, nah, it's not God. How do you know? I don't know, but it's not God. Well, God told me. No, nah, it's not God. <laughs> so, you know, you have to be careful. When the Spirit of God comes and speaks into your heart, you have to be sensitive to know that's very awkward. 
But to make me change directions of my thoughts, now either it's got to be God or you had too much gherkins. But I think this was, this was a lesson. And the lesson was this. When God many times speak to you about things, it's not always strange. It's something that you already heard or know. And God confirms that to you. Now, when you look at this story, I don't know if you notice that you can read this story in four places. And in the four places that you read, they all sound the same. But if you just uncover it slightly, you start to realize they're not the same. They're different periods of time. Now, if you remember, Jesus meets them at the Sea of Galilee three years earlier. And guess what they were doing? Looking for fish. And Jesus comes three years earlier and he says, hey guys, you got any fish? They go, no. Throw the net on the other side. Three years before. The same sea, they throw the net on the other side and the Bible says, and as they were pulling the fish, it was so much that the nets tore. Three years. Three years later, the same sea, the same men. Hey guys, you got any fish? I would have said, yeah, I know, throw it on the other side. You would all have said that. Yeah, I just throw it on the other side. Yeah, I know, I know, yeah, 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 yeah. And it, you see him coming, and it's like for some people, it's like, you know when God spoke to you a year ago? Yeah. Do you think God's, nah, 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 nah. It's like, he speaks to you, and he speaks to you again, and he speaks to you again, and you still won't throw the net on the other side. And God's got to keep saying, uh, for yea, I say to you, my daughter, again. <laughs> Thus save me again. Every time God's got to keep saying, for yea, yea. <laughs> I'm not surprised some people go, yo, listen to me. <laughs> I think, that's, I think that's the interpretation of the Greek zeo. Because, because it's kind of like, how many times does he have to tell you? It's like, cast your net. It's, you know, some of us have not left the church. We've been here for years. <laughs> right? And God spoke to you many times in the same church. You know what's so ironic? is when he gets an evangelist. Or he gets a pastor who don't even know who you are. He goes, yeah, can I come, come here for a minute? He's like, for yay. It's like, how did he know that? Maybe it's God. <laughs> you, what, I think what should happen, the next evangelist call you up, you should go, hold on a minute. For yay, I say to myself, yay, I must listen. <laughs> because because he's, he's going to tell you the same thing. And that's the issue. When will you be sensitive enough to know God? When God is actually trying to speak into your life, trying to get you to a place, and we always think it's going to be, you know, a different place. But oftentimes in the scripture, it's always the same place. He always brings you back to the same place that you were at the beginning. Because there's something about God that's trying to not just speak into your life, listen, to prosper your life. So when God speaks to people and in your heart and asks you to obey, it's not always like he's telling me to obey because there's danger. You know, you know, there's danger, I might die. That's, that's inevitable. We're all going to get that place anyway. So he's not talking about he's trying to preserve your life like a pickle. What he's trying to do is prosper your life. He's trying to help you in your life. Trying that your life will count and mean something. That there's a purpose. Sometimes when God does things and speaks to you, it's because God unleashes and opens up the porthole to your life. There's areas in your life you have no idea that exist. You know, sometimes, you know, you know, I hadn't gone out for probably a year or whatever, you know, abroad or whatever like that and done a revival. So I did a revival and, um, um, in Holland and I, I realized, you know, so here I am and doing a revival. And by the time, you know, the first night, the first morning, 
you know, you probably give about, I don't know, 15 different people words. And then the night time, and I'm thinking, man, I haven't done that for a long, wow. You know, and then I'm realizing God, you know, sp- you know speaking and helping me. And it, it felt, you know, here I am thinking, wow, not doing that for a long time. You know, I felt like an evangelist. I'm like, yeah, you over there. <laughs> and it's like, but, you know, the issue is what I'm saying is that he opens areas of your life again. Um, you know, sometimes you say, you know, man, God doesn't speak to me. Well, maybe if you go fishing, he might. Maybe if you're out there. Maybe if you put yourself in a place, not just, uh, you know what, I'm just sitting here. I'm just going to wait for him to speak. You know, it's when we're active in Christ, when we're actively doing something. Many times when we leave the comfort zone, the shore, you know, we go out and to do great works. And God many times has to speak to you to reassure you. But it's always going to be in the same place because it's prosperity is prospering your life. That's what God many times wants to do. You know, there's something about God that when he saves you, he saves you from, you know, not just hell, but saves you from destructions, mental, whatever it may be, but brings you to a place where he wants to start adding and blessing your life. Remember, God is a father. And that's where he, you know, we say God, and he says, listen, just call me father. And he tries to give you an understanding, uh, again, the American word, uh, definition to that, or the Greek and Hebrew, but the definition was papa. So he's saying, you know what, I want, to, I want to not, this is who I am, I'm this because of what I do. I'm the father because I take care of you. And so he, he's not that the father, God, you're the father. He says, no, the only reason I'm the father is because I take care of you like a father. And so I want to prosper your life. I want to benefit your life. I want to put things in your life. I want to sustain your life. I want to bring good hope and health and strength. But most of all, mental stability in your life. This is what I want to do. Where you've been tormented. I want to steady your mind. I want to show you things that you can't see what I can do for you. I want to show you things afar off. Not what you see here today, but far off. This is, this is what a father does. A father takes a child and says, son, one day all that will be yours. And the guy's like, but dad, I'm only free. Don't worry about it, son. All of that. Right? So a father tries to uh, expound the child's mind to show the child. Uh, you know, there's some people when they, they say, my dad, you know, they get older and say, yeah, my dad has about, he has this business, he has that, he's got that house, he's got that house. When he, if anything happens, I, it's, all, it's all mine. Right? But that happened years ago when his dad was putting that into his head. Son, this is what I have for you. And it's the same thing with God. To prosper us. And it doesn't mean that you and I will be financial, is a financial prosper. But the Bible says your soul will prosper. That when you look at somebody, they're well in their soul. You know, when, uh, you know, before our salvation, we're troubled souls. You know, you hear the word, his soul is troubled. And so his soul is heavy. There's many things weighing upon the person's soul. There's many, you know, Martha, Martha, Jesus says, you know, what, what's the problem? Why, you know, y- your soul is heavy. To prosper the soul, to give the soul that is well inside of you. But that only happens when we listen. So you can do your own thing. Now, I'm going to close. <laughs> ah, I can't believe it. <laughs> I'm going to close. So this message was inspired. So brother Nathan's on the phone with me. And if he hears this recording, he goes, I, just, I, I said that. <laughs> no, it wasn't Nathan if you're listening to. Um, but so I'm speaking to Nathan. It was Saturday in the morning. So he phones me early in the morning. I'm thinking, so he phones me Friday. And uh, so he's He's disappointed. Because he's got this band coming and he books this hall in the center of town. And, you know, you know, Nathan's like, oh, I thought it was, oh my God. Oh. You know, so Nathan's, Nathan's like, he's, he's, he's puzzled. He's, he's, he's like, 
I know, guess what? I said, what? They cancelled it. So I'm like, yeah, don't worry about it. It'll be all right. So Nathan's like, did you hear what I said? They cancelled the haul. So I'm like, yeah, don't worry about it, Nathan. It's cool. It'll be fine. Try and get another one. Weeks later, Nathan phones me and he goes, I got another. So he gets this, um, there's a big festival in town and they gave him like a tent or a, an area to play the music. So now Nathan's like, yeah, he's over the moon. He's going, I'm in the middle of this whole kind of fear or this fate or whatever it is. He's happy. Then he phones me and he goes, you never believe it. They cancel me again. I said, so serious? So now he's like, the town is against me. The dark side. And so Nathan's like, that's it, man. The dark side. I never know this would happen so quick. So, I, so he phones me looking for some comforting words. So I said, hey, Nathan. He goes, what? Don't worry about it. <laughs> he's, like, he's, like, he's, he's baffled. So I'm like, it'd be fine. He goes, but you don't understand. I said, what? I've only got a couple of days to get a haul and the band is coming. I said, Nath, don't worry about it, man. So he phones back. This one now, Saturday morning, he says, I found a place. So I said, okay, wh where did you find it? He goes, well, this place is further down. He says, I've never been this place before. And he's a bit discouraged. So I said to him, Nathan, listen. The first place didn't work. The second place didn't work. Cast it on the other side. Don't worry about it. I said, Jeremiah said, let the blood be upon your hands. Your job, my job, is just to preach. If people don't want to get saved, and listen, the blood's not on my hands. I did all that I can. When they stand before God, they have to say, I didn't hear. And he goes, you remember that little red-skinned man in the street? <laughs> <laughs> right? He would tell me, I know, I saw him play back the video. You know, I don't know, no video, but you know. So I said, I'm telling him, just cast your net, Nathan. And I could feel in him, he's like, you know what? After about a couple of you know, 20 minutes, Nathan was like, you know what? I'm just going to cast my net. And I said, it might just be God was trying to get you to cast your net on the other side. But the problem, Nathan, you were, your net was already there. And to pull your net meant so much arrangements with the band, the people, plus the flyers. Oh, but the flyers, I didn't, so I, I, I already knew all the, 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 you know, what he was thinking. I'm like, hey, listen, I understand, but just cast your net. I said, Nathan, you're just, hey, listen, we don't know. God's put you here. Let's see what happens. So he cast his net. So during the song service, why I got the idea to write this sermon this today was he texts me uh, in the afternoon and he says, hey, pastor, we did this concert. And he says, incredible. He goes, he's, so his words were, God was there, actually. I have it here. I have his words, so just in case he says, I didn't say it like that. <laughs> he says, hi, pastor. 14 people were saved yesterday. It says, now I have a lot of work to do during July and August. We had a great time in the street. Very good. God was there. So sometimes God really calls us to cast our net on the other side. Even though you've traveled this road before. Even though you've seen the same results and, yeah, there's no fish, today they're not biting. Sometimes in life, you're going to have to trust God. And sometimes God gets you to a place where, you know what? He will bring no fish for you. You will have no fish. And you'll be like, why is there no fish? Remember the Old Testament? He gets the people to a place and they turn around and, and he says, you, you know you know, when you're thinking all oh, this was good, this was happening for you, and Judge says, it was me that was really doing it. I did it to get you here because I wanted to help you. And I knew there was nothing there, so I brought this here, this calamity here, so you'll move here, so you would cry out to me. 
And there's some time God will, will bring you to a place where he wants you to cry out and you think, well, that's very unfair. It would be very unfair if you went down the road and there was nothing there. And God brings you to a place where you're crying out to him so you can move here that there's things here. Because a good father always lays up good for their children. And God's a good father. And it just might be that God wants to prosper your life. It just might be God wants to open doors in your life. It just might be God is looking at your future for, yea, I know the plans that I have for you are plans for prosperity and not for evil, but yes, a plan to prosper you, he says. And maybe it's God that wants to do that. But the real problem, we won't cast the nets. Because it's like the man who just every day pickle and onions for lunch. Pickle and onions, pickle and onions. And says to his friends, listen, if, if I ever get pickle and onions tomorrow, I'm going to kill myself. Yeah. Next day, he gets pickle and onions. Jumps off the bridge. And his friends at the funeral saying, I don't know why he jumped off the bridge. He said he kept on making them pickle and onions. And his wife said, me? He made it himself. Nah, you're too slow. Basically, sometimes you write your own fate. Sometimes you do it to yourself. You keep dishing yourself up with pickle and onions. And God has good things for you, but you won't obey. Tonight, my question is to you is this. Will you cast the net on the other side? There's areas in your life where it's not prospering. There's no fruits. And Peter says, Lord, we've toiled all night and we've seen nothing now it's daybreak jesus said it. he goes now it's daybreak all night now it's daytime all night they've been doing the same thing now it's the daytime and jesus comes along a fisherman meets a, a carpenter and very unusual but the carpenter says just throw it on the other side learn to take instructions for the most unusual people around you not everything you see and understand maybe someone knows something what you don't know trust God cast your net or just believe in God in a sense that God I'm going to walk on water I'm going to believe you I'm going to put my faith in you maybe this is you but don't sit here and eat pickle and onions all day. Amen? Amen. Every head bow, every eye close. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. These digital things are very good because they've got a little clock on it. <laughs> they tell me how long I'm preaching. Amen. Pastor Brown will be very pleased with me. He's been trying to get me to do this <laughs> for years. Amen. So, as our heads are bowed and eyes are closed for one moment in time, I don't know the circumstances in your life, but I do know this. Martha, Martha, you are weighed down with many issues of life. You're here tonight and you're weighed down. You're here, you're here, but you're not here. You're listening, but you're not listening. You're just clocking in, checking in. But the truth is, it's not you that's checking in. It's God that wants to speak to you. And that's why you're here. Brought you here. Bible says no man comes to God unless the Spirit of God draws him. And I would submit to you today that God's drawn you here because he wants to speak to you. To cast your net on the other side. You've been trying. You've been doing the same thing, the same thing, and you've got nowhere. You've been working out in your head, just like these fishermen. They've all worked it out. They all understand. They know the drill. But this is a bit different. Because all of a sudden, Jesus comes along on the scene. And says, you know what? Try something else. Try and listen to me. Obey me and see 
if you will not be fruitful. See if fruits won't be your portion tonight. And that's you this evening. And I want to encourage you, maybe you're not saved. Maybe you've, you've walked away from Jesus a bit. Maybe you're backslidden. Maybe you've turned away. And, but you've come tonight and said, you know what? This is where I really want to be. I want Jesus in my life. I want change. And that's you. Can I ask you to do one thing while your head's bowed and eyes are closed? Could I ask you to slip your hands up if God has spoken to you? You want salvation? You want to be saved? Would you slip your hands up? Slip it straight back down. We'll pray for you. Can we pray for you tonight? Jesus, would you be my Lord, my Savior? Would you come in my heart and change me? Is there anyone in here that would quickly slip their hands up and say, that's what I want. I want change. All over this place, front to back, left to right. We're going to change the order of this service very quickly. And speak to Christians very quickly. You're a Christian here. And maybe that's you you kind of known God has been speaking to you or, or on your case the same Galilean there were that same sea the same sea it was the same place three years ago God spoke to them the same thing three years later we're not talking about 10 20 Three years later, they see Jesus on the same shore, the same place, and said the same thing. And they did the same thing, but this time the net didn't break. And they had to call people in to help them. The same situation. So it makes you realize that God doesn't change his mind about what he wants you to do. You may change your mind. He does not change his mind. He had a plan for them three years before and three years later. For some people in this place, you may be struggling and thinking, I wonder if God's thinking different about me. No, he's not. Look at all the turmoil the disciples went through. All the issues, all the things, denying Jesus, walking away from Jesus. And he still had the same plan. Three years. Sometimes we get saved and we, we say to ourselves, Pastor, I feel like I'm going downhill. My life is going nowhere. I think, and so, and so as our life perpetuates in our mindset that it's going downhill, it's not the same past of my life. Look at me, I'm a mess. I used to be on fire. I used to do that. And, that. and so surely God doesn't want to use me. You're talking about people who cursed God. Stood this. I don't even know the bloke. I've never seen him in my life. You're talking about people who now was thinking about crucifying. You know, people that had a different mindset. And he still meets them and says the same thing so either it's true where the scripture says my thoughts towards you will not change that God doesn't change his mind about you irrespective of where you are or how you personally feel inside your feelings well I feel I feel like this today I feel this and I, I feel this I, I misunderstand God says well okay I, I hear you but I'm still the same. I'm not changing my mind, my plan towards you. I still want to bless you. I blessed you before and you lost the blessing. And I'm still willing to bless you again. That's a good God. And so maybe you're here and maybe that's you. Your whole Christianity is run at this moment by feelings. Is on an autopilot of feelings. Well, can you feel this, what I'm saying? Feel this. God loves you. You feel that? He hasn't changed. He still has the same thoughts towards you. And he still wants to bless you the same way. You feel that? Because whatever you're feeling, it's not right. This is the right feeling. He's still the same towards you. And he still wants you 
to go out and do his will and he still wants to bless you in that maybe God has touched your a core of your heart then I want to open this altar because maybe it's you God is speaking to tonight to help you because he still has a plan so this altar is open for you to come why don't you come find a place where your knee will touch the ground and say oh God as Peter says oh God my Lord my God that's what he said this is him he's come back this altar is open come let's pray let's find a place where God will have his way in our hearts this altar is open maybe it's you just maybe it's you God is speaking to this altar is open hallelujah Father I thank you God by your grace and by your mercy, God, I pray, God. Father, by your blood, God, I'm praying, God, heal the hearts of your people, God. Cause them to hear your voice in a new way. Pray in your seats. Speak to God. God, help me. God, help me to hear your voice. That still, small, powerful voice of God that speaks to you in the stillness of the hours. He wants to help you. Oh, my soul, Lord. God, breathe upon your people tonight. Spirit of God, move in this place. breathe upon your people God this evening God the Father Spirit of God heal their hearts You know, Kapil, you know, the, the, the thing about God, he's not the, um, you can carry on, carry on. He's not the, um, he's not the, what you're finding is that confusion. 
thoughts and trying to determine what's what. But the Bible says he's not the author of confusion. He doesn't design. God is very straight, very black, very white. It's simple. And so the inner struggles and the confusion you're finding itself, answering my own questions, uh, overthinking what, you know, this is what I want, but this is not God. He's simple. He puts his hands on you and he's called you. And it's, it's a done deal. And we always have the struggle with the enemy of our soul. But, you know, the Bible says you're washed by the blood. He's purchased you and it's a done deal. He saved you for a reason, a purpose. Walk in that, that wisdom. Father, by your grace, my God, I pray for my brother can heal God. I pray, God, your hands upon him, God. Heal and touch him in a new way, God. Breathe upon him. I rebuke the stronghold with satanic powers, God, that will come against him, God. I pray, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Sister, um, let me just say this, just, just a quick encouragement for you. There's, um, it's like God would say to you, you've been, it's like you've been fishing, doing the same thing. But what you've been doing is very um, systematic. It's like the same thing, you, you know and everything, all the, everything is in the right place. But in this sermon, he says, cast a net. If I would say it like this, God would say, I dare you to cast a net on the other side. And the other side for you is the unknown because of order. You're very orderly and think systematic. But it's like God said, cast the net. Now, the casting the net doesn't mean trying something new. The actual casting the net means, trust me. You know, the devil even knew when he came to Jesus and he brought him in the wilderness. He says, if you will dash your foot against the rock, you know that the Father will catch you. And so Jesus repeats and he says, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. But here's the thing. Even the devil knew that God would catch him. And the truth is, when God says, trust me, it means even if you cast your foot, I'm going to catch you. I'm going to help you. He's with you. Just trust him. Amen. In my heart's of hearts Oh, yeah That my soul You make your face shine Make your face to shine on me That my soul knows That my soul, that my, that my soul, Lord, that 
on somebody, let's praise God. Oh, Rama, Mama, Mama, we worship you, Jesus. You worthy, Lord. Wonderful Savior, wonderful God, you are, yeah. Hallelujah. We serve a wonderful God. Could you say amen? Amen. He wants to help us. And you can go home and say, you know what? You get the feeling that, you know what? I cast the net that side or that side. He's going to help us anyway. Because he's a good, good father. Amen. We're going to close in a word of prayer. We thank God for his grace and his mercy and his love. Amen. So we're going to close. Fellowship with somebody. Amen. And don't forget Blur is on. <laughs> Amen. But, uh, <laughs> but there you go. Let's pray and let's believe God. Amen. Brother Keith, why don't you bless us with your prayers. Amen.